let me just first uh, welcome all of you here. <clears throat> uh, what we want uh, in Pakistan is closer uh, relationship with the uh, Chinese media, and especially uh, from the Prime Minister and his office, we want to have a closer liaison. We have probably one of the most uh, deepest, strongest relationship uh, between China and Pakistan. But the interaction between uh, uh, our medias, uh, our cultural interaction is not as uh, good as, as a political relationship. So uh, this idea uh, meeting today is basically to improve this interaction. Uh, I, I especially want to take this occasion to uh, congratulate China and the Communist Party. I think on its 100th, uh, it is uh, the anniversary of uh, uh, the CPC. Uh, also, uh, in Pakistan, we admire President Xi Jinping as one of the great statesmen of uh, the modern world. We have uh, admiration for him in Pakistan for two particular reasons. One, his commitment uh, to fight corruption, the, the commitment that uh, a society uh, m must be, there must be rule of law in a society. In other words, uh, the powerful must be brought under the law. And corruption is, uh, when it destroys a country, it is when there is a corrupt elite which does not bring itself under the rule of law, and they are the ones who do the maximum damage. So I have uh, watched the corruption drive, anti-corruption drive of uh, President Xi Jinping, and we here in Pakistan are very impressed by the way he has uh, so many high-level uh, officials, ministerial-level people have been um, held accountable for their uh, for their corrupt for for their corruption secondly and the most uh, remarkable thing about um, china which we all admire is that the way they have brought so many millions of people out of poverty the figure we are told is uh, almost uh, 700 million people have been brought out brought out of poverty in the last uh, 6 7 years and recently, uh, China announced that China has finally eliminated uh, extreme poverty. So this is, I think, uh, one of the most remarkable achievements of any human society. I don't think there is any precedent in history of uh, a society achieving these great goals. Uh, and the third thing is that we in Pakistan are committed uh, to strengthen our relationship with China politically as well as uh, 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 in terms of e economy and trade. CPAC is a flagship program uh, uh, in the BRI and for Pakistan it is one of uh, a program which gives us the greatest optimism and hope for our future economic development. And we, are, we have a high-level committee now to, to follow the CPEC projects. I'm going to Gawadar next week to uh, see the, um, uh, uh, oversee the projects, the pace which they are moving on and, and to make sure that we meet our timelines. Uh, and then I'm hoping... Chinese labor. Yes, meet, meeting the Chinese labor, you know, who, who are working here. Uh, and yes, talk to them, interact with them. Uh, but also, um, I look forward to my trip to, to uh, China, which is in the offing in the next month, two months, and to further strengthen both our political uh, ties and our economic ties. Please go ahead. So, uh, as Your Highness just to say, that uh, the, in 2020, the Communist Party uh, already make a huge success in helping its people eliminate in, in eliminate poverty. Also, it helps uh, the country to navigate its people uh, throughout the pandemic while achieve the uh, positive GDP growth. So, uh, the 
um, the CPC is continually using its people-centered people policy so uh, to, towards its people and towards governing, governing this country. So how do you comment, uh, co comment on this people-centered policy? And how do you think is CPC's role in the development of China? You see, the CPC is a unique model. Until now, we were told that the best way of uh, societies improving themselves uh, uh, is the Western uh, system of democracy. And we were told that that is the best way of uh, progress of a society. But what the CPC has done is that it has brought this alternate model. And they have achieved, they have actually uh, beaten all Western democracies in the way they have in the way they have brought up uh, merit in the society. You see what is remarkable? A, a, a society succeeds if that society has systems which bring two things forward, meritocracy and accountability. Accountability of the ruling elite, which means a transparent system, which is very important for progress. And secondly, which brings up merit in a society. So until now, the feeling was that democracy is the uh, electoral democracy is the best way uh, where you get merit uh, leadership based on merit and then hold that leadership accountable. But what CPC has done is that without that electoral democracy, it has actually achieved that at much better. The what I saw uh, in China when I when I visited the Communist Party headquarters and when they gave us briefings. Their system of sifting talent and then grooming it and bringing it up, for me, is, uh, is probably more remarkable than any democratic, electoral democracy uh, uh, does not bring up that sort of meritocracy or uh, uh, can hold uh, people accountable. And third thing is that it's a very flexible system. You know, when they want to change something, that system allows them to bring a change. In our society, for instance, in Pakistan, even in Western democracies, it's very difficult to change, bring change in a system because you're stuck in so many uh, regulations and democracy straight jackets you. So you cannot always do what is the best for the society because of all the impediments in our system. Whereas I find that in the, the greatness of the way China has improved so quickly is because they, they make changes very quickly. They feel that something is not working, they change it. The system allows them to change. And the fourthly, of course, the long-term planning, uh, they plan so far ahead. Uh, sometimes in a, in a democracy, you, you only, I mean in an electoral democracy, you only look for the next five years and it stops, it contradicts long-term planning. Hi, uh, Nicole. Hi, Mr. Rory. Uh, uh, grateful. Thank you for hosting this uh, meeting online on the Ocean Forum China Daily. And another question like, is being decided to since the China and the Pakistan established the uh, diplomatic relationship as well as the friendship between those two. So, among all the projects that the two sides have worked on, where do you see the future development uh, direction and the cooperation direction of the China-Pakistan economic corridor? And which areas could be the focus points in the next few years? And how do you think of the importance of such cooperation for both countries? Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, you see, the for me, where I see this uh, relationship moving ahead, and I mean the economic relationship because there is the political relationship which is also very strong and moving ahead. But purely the economic relationship, <clears throat> I see the next phase of uh, CPAC. And the next phase is for Pakistan, which is very exciting. We have these special economic zones. And uh, you know we hope that, with, uh, we hope to attract Chinese uh, industry into these special economic zones by giving them incentives because uh, there's a in Pakistan the labor is much cheaper than in China so we hope to uh, attract uh, uh, that industry which will benefit from our, our, our cheaper labor. 
Uh, and secondly, we, where we really want help from China and we're already working on it, is agriculture. Because in China, the productivity, your agricultural productivity is much higher than Pakistan. Pakistan is basically an agricultural country. And we haven't really concentrated so much on our agriculture to improve our productivity. So we really, this is the second phase because uh, the, almost half our population lives off agriculture. And therefore, we hope that uh, we can really benefit from the latest techniques in agriculture from China. So, Your Highness, my second question is related to the first one. I think you just made a great insight about uh, the Communist Party's way of uh, socialism democracy and also the Western-style uh, electoral democracy. So my second question is, uh, how do you view the leadership style of uh, uh, Xi Jinping as the core of the CPC party? What kind of image do you think he create on the international stage? You see, President Xi Jinping, when I spoke to him, and Premier Li, what struck me was that the, the process which, which uh, they have come through to become the Prime Minister and the President, they started work uh, 30 years ago. And they started working right from the canton, the real village level. And from there, they, 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 they worked all the way up. They went through all the processes. So really, it's that long struggle which is what makes a leader. And that sort of process uh, is not prevalent in, in most of the, the countries that claim to have electoral democracy. You do not have that sort of proce process. So you look at the American president. He does not go through that sort of rigorous uh, training for leadership like, like, um, like President Xi Jinping and Premier Li. And, and the way they worked themselves up and the experience they got all the way from village and then to the province and you know, higher levels. So they, when they get to the top, they are, com they, are complete, they are experienced, they completely understand the system, they understand how people live at the bottom, and which is why they have been able to, uh, you know, create this wonder of, of uh, bringing so many millions of people out of poverty. So this is something quite unique for China. You do not see that in any other democratic system. Uh, I think, leave alone the, the rivalry now between America and, uh, and, and China, you know, this economic rivalry. But I can tell you that the world, no matter what, whether, whatever they think of China, um, you know, because there's a fear of China's economic dominance now. But apart from that, everyone has to admire what President Xi Jinping has done. You know, his achievements, you see, uh, leaders' achievements speak for, for themselves. And that's what President Xi Jinping has, uh, has proved to the world. Your Excellency, how do you comment on the aid programs provided by China to Pakistan, including vaccine, infrastructure, vocational training, and in other social livelihood sectors? I think, uh, you know, first of all, the way China dealt with uh, uh, COVID was unique. I mean, consider considering that this this uh, pandemic started in China, the way China uh, coped with it. And then when you look at the rest of the world, you know, China really stands out in the way they, they dealt with this pandemic. Uh, and we must, we are very thankful to China because, uh, you know, uh, the way they helped us, the way they donated uh, the vaccine to us. Uh, and really, it's one, Pakistan is one of, uh, after China, Pakistan is one of those countries which has actually done very well uh, in the way that we dealt with the uh, pandemic, the, the way w which we cope with it. So Pakistan stands out, you know, in this whole region. Uh, and one of the reasons is that China provided us the, the, uh, the vaccine very early on and where we uh, immediately vaccinated the health workers. The first thing we did was vaccinate the health workers and then went for the vulnerable groups. So, you know, the people who were most at risk uh, and 
we were all worried about were the health workers because you know they had to deal with uh, with with the patients and so we were always worried that you know if they became demoralized then you know our health system would fail so when we were able to thanks to china we were able to vaccinate them that gives gave us a lot of confidence my name is Yushin. it's a great pleasure to be able to talk to you even via zoom on this very prosperous occasion when China is celebrating the 100th anniversary of the founding of the CPC. But this year is also a very special year for China and Pakistan as both countries are celebrating 70 years of diplomatic relations, 70 years of friendship. So I'd like to ask you, uh, based on what you just talked about, about the uniqueness of the Chinese system and uh, the kind of uh, strong relationship that Pakistan has fostered with China, what do you think the 70 years of friendship uh, between China and Pakistan means for the region and for the world? And where do you see relations going further? How to deepen these already very strong ties? Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> well, firstly, for, let me just talk about Pakistan and China first, and then the region. For Pakistan, uh, uh, there was always a very special relationship with China, although our relationship started 70 years ago. But, you know, China, whenever Pakistan was in trouble, whenever I'm, I'm in trouble politically, internationally, when we had conflicts with our neighbor, China always stood with us. So the people of China have a special place in the hearts of people of Pakistan. Because the, everyone here remembers, you know, you only, you only remember a friend who stands with you in your difficult times. In good times, everyone stands with you. But in, in your difficult, tough times, bad times, you remember those people who stood by you. That's why you will find that in, in Pakistan, they, people always have a special fondness for people of China. So this relationship has only got stronger. Even now, politically, uh, you know, on, on the uh, international forums, Pakistan and China always stand together. And now, when you talk about the region, there's this strange uh, uh, great power rivalry taking place. You know, you see the United States and the United States being uh, wary of China, and, you know, you, you know, I don't need to say all this is now public knowledge, you know, the, the way uh, China and the United States are sort of looking at each other. Uh, it, so it creates problem because what United States is doing is it's, for, it's formed this uh, re regional uh, alliance called the Quad, which is US, uh, uh, India, and then, you know, a couple of other countries. So from that point of view, Pakistan thinks that it is very unfair for the U.S. or other powers, Western powers, for, for countries like us to take sides. Why do we have to take sides? We should, be, we should have good relationship with everyone. And, you know, it's not going to happen that if Pakistan is, if uh, there's pressure put on Pakistan to change its relationship or, 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 or uh, downgrade its relationship with China, it won't happen because the relationship between Pakistan and China is very deep. And it's, it's not just the governments, it's a people-to-people -people relationship. So um, uh, to, uh, to sum up, whatever will happen, our relationship between the two countries, no matter what pressure is put on us, is not going to change. But how do you deepen these already very strong ties, Your Excellency? Number one is trade. You know, the CPAC is, is a really, it's right in front of you, it's something. It's the biggest thing happening in Pakistan. For us, this is, this is where we think um, our, our economic future is moving towards. So this is a big uh, uh, economic um, uh, feature in, in Pakistan. Uh, and then there's the political relationship. And political rela relationship has got stronger. And it's got stronger because uh, uh, whatever happens in every international forum,
Pakistan and China stand together. Mr. Prime Minister, my second question is about Olympic Games. Beijing will host the 2022 Olympic and Paralympic Winter Games next year. So, Your Excellency, how do you comment on China's efforts to host the Games and what are your expectations for the Games? Well, I, I watched the, on television, of course, the, the Olympics in China. And you always find that a country that is on the ascendancy, it also, its sports also follows, follows in the same direction. It also, in sporting, uh, I mean, China, if you look back, China's performance 30 years ago, and now you compare now in Olympics, China is now the emerging power in, in sports as well. So the, the two go together because all the, uh, the skills, the, the institutionalization that goes into a nation building and a nation moving forward are exactly the same in which a nation sports move forward. Because you, you, uh, uh, you compete internationally in sports, the better you become, the better your institutions become, which can sift talent and bring merit on the top. So a small country like New Zealand just now, uh, I know you don't play cricket in, in, um, in China, but a, a country which of five million people has just won the Cricket World Championship from India, which has uh, 1.3 billion people. And five million people, uh, a country of five million people has actually won a championship against them because they have a very good system of sifting, bringing up talent and polishing it. So countries clearly which have, which institutionalize better, uh, they, 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 they move upwards because the system of polishing the talent in the country is better than the others. What about China's efforts to prepare for this game, especially in this typical time of COVID-19? Well, we are just watching in Japan also they're having problems of uh, hosting Olympics. And there's a lot of problem because of COVID. Uh, the answer is I don't know, really, because we do not know the trajectory of the COVID situation. You think that you, you now got under control and then you have some Delta variant coming in and then again people get worried. So it's a world is coming to terms with this disease, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this pandemic. Uh, so we, we, we're not in a position right now to make very firm calculations and decisions about the future right now. So uh, the answer is I don't know. Good wishes are to China. Yes, we, we, we wish them all the best. Uh, Your Excellency, I would like to ask you that in China, the efforts of the different efforts of the China are being taken from America and other countries of the Arab countries are being taken from the Arab countries. And now, the summit of G7 was given to the summit of G7, on the 13th of June of the summit of G7, on the 13th of June of the summit of Hong Kong, the China and other countries of the China are being taken from the China and China are being taken from the China. So, what is your opinion? You see, the, uh, first of all, uh, our interaction with the Chinese officials, uh, the, the, uh, that version of uh, what is happening in Xinjiang is completely different to the version of uh, what we hear from the Western media and the Western governments. So uh, because we have a very strong relationship with China, uh, and because we have, uh, we have a relationship based on trust, so we actually accept the Chinese version. You know, what, what they say about, uh, you know, their programs in Xinjiang, so we accept it. The second point is that we find it a little bit hypocritical when there are much worse human rights issues in the world which get no attention, for instance, in Kashmir, Kashmir is a huge human rights uh, problem. Uh, there are about 9 million, 8 million Kashmiris which are, which are basically uh, have been put into an open prison uh, until recently. It's, uh, the, it's a police state where uh, there are uh, extrajudicial killings, there's imprisonment, there's arbitrary arrests and a ban on media, and yet there is hardly any comment adverse comment in the Western media. 100,000 
Kashmiris have died in the last 30 years for, for freedom struggle. It's a disputed territory. Yet you do hardly get any coverage in the Western media. And, and we hear about Xinjiang and Hong Kong, uh, which is a bit hypocritical. دوسرا سوال میں پوچھنا چاہوں گا ویکسینیشن کے حوالے سے خوشائن بات یہ ہے کہ پاکستان میں حکومت کی جانب سے ویکسینیشن کا آغاز کیا گیا اور لوگ جوک در جوک اس میں حصہ لے رہے ہیں اور خاص طور پر چینی ویکسینز سائنو فارم سائنو ویک اور کینسائنو لگائی جا رہی ہے اس دوران وبائی صورتحال کے دوران جو چین اور پاکستان کا تعاون رہا اور اب بھی جاری ہے اس حوالے سے آپ کی رائے جاننا چاہیں گے چائنا ہیلپڈ اس ان دا بگننگ Uh, and because of that, we were able to uh, vaccinate our health workers and the vulnerable sections, the senior uh, sections of the society. And even now, we have a very close cl collaboration going on with China. We are expecting uh, another uh, consignment coming soon. Uh, and so uh, today, we are we ex uh, expecting a consignment. And it's one reason, it is one reason that we have really been able to cope Uh, with this pandemic compared to all our neighbors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the C1G family conference. So the previous reporters has already asked questions that I want to ask. So I want to ask the follow-up question regarding things now. We noticed that recently some West media criticized you only because you didn't criticize China's policy in Xinjiang. So some media even said that this should how China fights silence over waivers. So what's your response to these voices? So I just answered this question, um, which I think it's, uh, you know, we have, with our interactions with the Chinese government, uh, you know, the Chinese version is completely different to the version which we hear uh, from the Western media and the Western government. So because of our close proximity and relationship to China, we actually accept the Chinese version. And uh, we all, I again repeat, we find it very hypocritical that uh, while the Uyghurs uh, situation is highlighted so much, and Hong Kong, on the other hand, Kashmir, which is a disputed territory between Pakistan and India, and their United Nations Security Council resolutions, which gave the Kashmiris the right to choose their own destiny through a plebiscite, yet there's hardly any mention of Kashmir, where 100,000 of Kashmiris have died. So, This is what we find in Pakistan very hypocritical. Now we notice that some people claim that a closer Pakistan-China relations will intensify conflicts in the region because of India. So what's your comment? Pakistan and China were always close. But uh, I think this idea that India is supposed to counterbalance China for the Western world, I think this is, very, this is going to be very detrimental for China. Bec uh, sorry, for, for India, not for China. China is too strong. India, India's, uh, the benefits India will get from trade with China are far greater than India trying to act as a, a sort of counterbalance. Uh, the, the country that will lose out is going to be India. The relationship, as I said, between China and Pakistan actually has nothing to do with India. We have 70 years of diplomatic relationship and through all crises in Pakistan's history, Pakistan has, has uh, China has stood with us. So it, it really has nothing to do with India. Our relationship is uh, a, a bilateral relationship is extremely strong. His Excellency, my question is uh, now Pakistan and China have set an example for the world about solidarity and cooperation in facing the global challenges. And how do you think the importance of building a closer China-Pakistan community of shared destiny and share the future for mankind? I think uh, the what I experienced uh, when I went to, uh, on the invitation of uh, President Xi Jinping, what I uh, noticed was the amount of work China is now doing uh, in, in terms of uh, improving the environment, fighting uh, a global warming. The awareness in China, in fact, they, uh, President Xi Jinping hosted a program 
in, in uh, now I forget what city is a, a special city which was just which is just uh, built. It's a um, it's an environmentally green city specifically built, which which we were, we were invited to. I don't remember the name of the city, but we went there, and everything there is environmentally friendly. So China is making great strides towards that. And I think the future of mankind, the biggest threat mankind faces is through this uh, climate change, global warming. Uh, and, and China really, uh, when it hosted, when President Xi Jinping hosted this conference, he invited leaders from all over the world and it was just, the theme was how to uh, save mankind from this catastrophe which is called climate change and global warming. Yes. Thank you so much, Excellency, for giving us this opportunity and it's really great honor for us. Uh, so, uh, my question is that the first phase of China-Pakistan economic corridor, CPAC, yields fruitful results in different areas including energy and infrastructure. First, how do you comment on this? And second, how will China and Pakistan cooperate to ensure the success of second phase of CPEC? Especially, how do you see sino economic growth? Thank you, Excellency. Firstly, uh, you know, the first phase of CPEC was connectivity and then uh, energy, uh, energy um, projects. So that was the first phase because Pakistan had problems with, we were at shortage of energy. And, and then of course the connectivity, uh, which, which is what the CPEC initially was. Now the second phase <clears throat> is now deeper cooperation. And that is, we special, for, from Pakistan point of view, the, the uh, uh, special economic zones and the idea is to attract investment into these special economic zones, which will help employment in Pakistan improve our growth rate, cre create wealth for our country. But equally important for us is the help from uh, China in, uh, in our agriculture. Now, as a half of our, po uh, our population lives off agriculture, and the productivity of our agriculture, unfortunately, is extremely low. So we have compared uh, the productivity in China, which compared to us is much higher. And then all the uh, various technologies which are used in agriculture. So the second phase is for us are special economic zones, uh, agriculture, also skills education. We are collaborating in, in, in uh, getting uh, skills education in Pakistan. How do you speak up this China-Pakistan economic cooperation? We have already, uh, now we formed a committee which is, the whole point of that committee, the CPEC committee, is to monitor the, uh, the CPEC projects and make sure that there are no impediments in their way. Okay. Um, your, your Excellency, my last question is about the future, the near future of international relations. As we are seeing with the new U.S. administration, there seems to be the talk of uh, alliance of like-minded countries to counter some kind of a, you know, other system or country. Uh, what is your understanding? How do you look at the trend, and uh, what do you think is the implication if such a trend really picks up momentum? Uh, I find this uh, a deeply worrying for the world. I find this uh, rivalry. Uh, for no rhyme or reason, <clears throat> I find this uh, worrying because then, just like in the Cold War, the world was divided between the Soviet camp and then the, uh, the American camp. And so it created a lot of problems for countries who, you know, they had to choose sides, either one side or the other. And then, uh, you know, for a short while, there was this, uh, the, the whole worry was this war on terror and the whole world was somehow involved in fighting terrorism. And now we see this emerging rivalry between China and the Western countries led by the US. Again, it's worrying. And people in Pakistan, we ask ourselves question, why do we have to two sides? We have a very deep relationship with China. And if someone asks us to choose sides, we, we find that China is a, 
friend for 70 years through highs and lows. They've stood with us. So people in Pakistan have this great faith and trust in, in our friendship with people in China. So why should we be asked to take sides now? Why can't we have a relationship with everyone? And this is the feeling right now because I think this, this uh, what past tells us, this world divided into camps, we find that this is detrimental to the, uh, uh, to, uh, to the world. How do you see things unfolding in Afghanistan? Well, that's the most difficult question you asked me. Uh, unfortunately, right now we do not have the answer because no one has the answer. You see what the, uh, uh, let me just say, the biggest mistake made by the Americans was that they kept on trying to find a military solution in Afghanistan when there was not one. They kept uh, uh, doing the same thing over and over and over again and thought they would get a different result. Because Afghanistan has a history and you know they, they just cannot be dictated from outside they do not accept outside uh, power intervention. They do, they do not find, they do not like to be controlled from powers from outside. That's the history. And so even when countries have conquered Afghanistan like the British did in the 19th century and then the uh, Russians invaded, uh, Soviets invaded Afghanistan in the 20th century, you can invade in Afghanistan but to keep, when you to stay there, it is very difficult to control the country because they are very independent-minded people. So this war, on, uh, this war in Afghanistan went on too long. It has created deep divisions in the Afghan society. When a war goes on for that long, when on both sides people have died, families have suffered, to bring them back together is not very easy. It takes time. And now what you're seeing in Afghanistan is that the moment the Americans decided there was no military solution, they gave a date of exit. And the moment they gave a date of exit, the, the Taliban, who were, the, who, who were opposing the Americans, considered that as a victory. Now when they think it's, they won the war, it's very difficult to make them, from Pakistan point of view, to make them then uh, come to some sort of a political settlement becomes very difficult. One, because the war went on too long, there are deep divisions. Secondly, once they feel they won the war, it's very difficult to make them now get back together. And so the worrying thing for Pakistan is that if Afghanistan has a civil war there, just like it had civil war after the Soviets left in 1989, then the consequences will be after Afghanistan, the country that will suffer the most is going to be Pakistan. Because, you know, we have a long border with Afghanistan. Taliban is basically a Pashtun uh, movement. And there are more Pashtuns in Pakistan than, than, than Afghanistan. Half the Afghanistan population is Pashtun. So the worry here is that we will be deeply affected by if there is a civil war. So therefore, we want there to be a political settlement at all costs. So before uh, concluding this session, I would like to inform uh, the media uh, that Prime Minister has written a special congratulatory letter to Prime Minister, uh, to President Xi on uh, CPC's 100 years, 100 years anniversary. Also Prime Minister has written uh, um, an op-ed that will appear in Chinese media, I believe this, uh, opinion this will be piece. opinion piece. And also, uh, keeping in view the close relationship and the kind of the way CPAC is going, we will interact with Chinese media more regularly. And we will keep inviting friends from Beijing, Shanghai, and also from here. And thank you very much for being part of this session. Thank you.